All right, you guys want to have a seat? We'll get started here. Hi, my name is Doug Wiles. I'm the forester with the city of Bismarck. Can you guys hear me? Fine, I'm kind of soft spoken most of the time. Um, so I've been in Bismarck. I'm not a North Dakotan. I'm from Missouri, lived in Idaho for a while. Uh, never thought I'd be here because there's no trees. That's what I thought as a Missourian okay. living in North Idaho. But um, I've been pleasantly surprised with the amount of trees here um, and just the, the culture and community. Uh, we really love it here. So I, I always share that because it's just ironic. This is where we end up because I swore to my wife when I graduated from grad school that I would never come to North Dakota where her family is from and we're here. And uh, I don't know, I shouldn't have, but we sure love it, love the river, love the community and the people here. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you guys about pruning. Like I said, I work for the city of Bismarck as a forester. We have about 24,000 trees on the boulevard. We prune those on a rotational basis, try to touch them once every seven to eight years. And then we take care of all the removals of diseased trees. We plant trees. Um, not enough. We plant between one and 200 a year. We remove probably 300 a year. Um, so we're not quite keeping up, but we also get a boost from development in the city because we require trees to be planted as a part of commercial institutional developments across town. So we're getting a lot. We've, we've increased our population of trees from about 22,700 in 2016 to about 24,000 right now. So we're moving in the right direction and then progressively removing ash trees when we can uh, fit it in with our staffing levels as much as possible. So we've reduced that from 36% in when I took the job with 15 to about 25% right now. So we're sitting good as the AB or sitting in a better spot as the AB is making its way east. But I'm gonna to talk to you about pruning. And I'm just curious, is this a conversation that comes up with you as technicians and in, in planting trees across the state? Like how in depth uh, are you providing advice? Because uh, I was trying to figure out how to present this information and you know I kind of landed on structural pruning is probably being the most beneficial for for you all as you're planting trees across the street um because otherwise it gets to be quite overwhelming for property owners to try to prune trees that are mature so just curious is it something you guys get into the weeds about on the technical aspects of it or is it just hey you guys should be doing this okay great well, I do a lot better if you guys just ask me questions along the way and we can, the conversation can move in and out of the presentation if you want. So just shout out or raise your hand. Um, and I'll try to remember to talk your way. But so what happens when you don't prune your trees? Um, this is, you guys have probably all seen this picture here and I'll try to use the pointer. But go down and leads, you know, most of the shade trees that we plant have decurrent growth. X current is more like our spruce tree, straight up and down. Uh, so you get co-dominant leads, which often have poor branch attachment. You get water sprouts on a lot of our fruiting trees, lots of dead branches. And you see included bark right here. That's when you don't have a good union or a nice wide union in the tree. As each branch grows in diameter, the bark begins pushing its bark. So it's not a solid attachment point, which is weak during loading events. And then you get whoop, epicormic branching or adventitious growth at the base of the tree. See that a lot with lindens that are planted too deep or that are under stress. And this is what I see a lot of in town, trees that haven't been pruned, especially structurally pruned at a young age. You see this uh, branch aspect ratio, which we're gonna talk about later. It's the ratio of the size of the lateral branch compared to the main stem of the tree. What happens there is you have a lot of loading on one side and it was poorly attached with probably some included bark and they rip out and see that all the time in ash trees across town. So that's a result of having trees that haven't been pruned in a forested environment, a native forest environment, like in the river bottoms or any other state that has a deciduous forest. Trees self prune and they're growing towards the sunlight. So you don't have this uh, growth form where the branches are tightly attached. A lot of times you still see it, but it's not as prevalent probably as it is in, in an urban environment or in a shelter belt where the sunlight is everywhere and there's leaves everywhere and trees are growing or branches are growing at a fast rate. Um, well, the seedlings, you can right away when you see a defect, if it's the right time of year, you can prune it. Um, 
try not to prune too much when they're initially planted, uh, especially with seedlings are going through a lot right then, not a lot of stored carbohydrates in the root system. So give them some time. Uh, we try to provide treatment within a couple of years of planting. And, you know, these are trees that are six to 10 feet tall uh, with seedlings. You know, hopefully you're weeding out ones that are have poor form to start with, uh, that, you know, have two stems that are equal, so, or, you know. So we do it pretty aggressively. When we see a co-dominant lead at the time of planting, we'll try to correct it. Um, yeah, if you want to wait a couple of years, that's plenty of time for the tree to kind of <coughs> become less stressed and then deal with the next stress of pruning. Um, I like this picture here. It's, I mean, you see a lot of them on, on the internet, but that black spot right there, that's just a good indicator there was included barking. So you can see how much wood was actually holding that other branch that failed together is very little. There's a, a big chunk right here that was just bark pushing against bark. So you have a pretty, it's pretty easy to understand why that tree failed in that situation, where if there was pruning treatments throughout the tree's life, this tree probably wouldn't have failed, you know, given our normal wind event of 70 miles an hour, four times a summer in North Dakota. Um, you know, a lot of these trees become pretty adapted to those as they grow and deal with it. But the right wind from the right angle could cause any tree to fail. But if this tree had been pruned properly at a young age, you probably wouldn't have an issue. It's difficult um, at the municipal level to, because practices have changed over time. You know, topping was a deal, uh, which created more problems, you know, I don't know how long ago that was practiced, but you still see it every once in a while, depending on how rural you travel. Um, but we still deal with those effects now, even though it hasn't been practiced for 25 years, I would assume, at least in the city of Bismarck. Um, so it's really hard, especially for homeowners that aren't educated. And this is where it, you know, it kind of lays in your hands to help educate these property owners. And I know you're not dealing with one or two trees on a property, you're dealing with thousands potentially, but at least introducing these ideas to stakeholders and property owners could be beneficial for them. So how can it be prevented? Uh, prune your trees. Have you guys ever been to an Arbor Day event in Bismarck? Any of you? Tom, of course, has. Uh, Beth has. Uh, so this is our mascot. It's Forrest Vaughn Flick and Tail. He's a 13 stripe gopher, uh, I guess. <laughs> he looks like a something else, but kids love him. So you'll see him a couple of times in this presentation. Um, so why do we prune? It's to build good structure. You want a good scaffold, um, scaffolding of branches, so they should be somewhat evenly spaced, you know, kind of like you're working your way up a ladder. And if, you, if you're looking down on the tree, they should be kind of radially spread out around the trunk of the tree. Um, you want to remove it all dead and diseased branches. You can remove dead branches any time of the year. <clears throat> Uh, you're going to look for co-dominant leads and included bark on your tree. And then um, I guess uh, do farmers talk about or property owners in the rural setting, they talk about clearance with equipment or anything like that when you guys are, are putting in your shelter belts. Is that a concern? Okay. So that's something that we talk about sight lines and um, in the city and clearance over the curb. And then what size branch or what size tree do you want at maturity? You guys seen this before? This is pretty uh, standard stuff here. But there's just a couple things that you should know about the tree. Um, so from A to B, that's the edge of the branch collar here. And that's important to know when you're pruning because that's where your final cut should be is right on the edge. And the reason for that being is there's bundles of cells in this branch collar which grow around the branch of the, where the wound is. Do trees heal or do they compartmentalize? Thank you. So they compartmentalize. The larger the, the wound on a tree, the longer it's going to take for that tree to compartmentalize. And when it takes a long time for a tree to compartmentalize, it's more opportunity for decay, fungi to enter the tree, and then for that to spread. So it's really important that you make your cut, your final cut. And we're going to talk about this more, you know, as close to the edge of that branch bark ridge as possible, or the branch collar as possible. Uh, this would be a stub. And then this is the branch bark ridge here. It's all important to be able to identify where these are when you start pruning. <clears throat> and you want to make your pruning cut outside the collar. Some trees are very difficult to identify where the collar is. Uh, lindens are 
really difficult. Um, it's not perfect like you see in this picture. It's rarely perfect like you see in this picture. Uh, but the more experience you have, the more time you spend around trees, you get, you, know, you look for little subtle differences in the shape of the tree and around where those branches uh, begin, and you can get a pretty good feel um, for where that branch part or branch collar is. The familiar three cup method. So you should never, you know, a little bitty branch doesn't matter, but a branch with any sort of leverage on the end. You should never just come in from the top and come straight down. Uh, I see this a lot with elm, even with the three cup method. When you're cutting late in the or early in the spring, everything's really slippery underneath the bark and you'll get rip out. And what happens when it's a rip out is that it's a larger wound and it prolongs the compartmentalization process. So the three cup method is important because it allows the leverage to be removed. So your first cut is underneath about through a quarter to a third of the tree. Then your second cut, which is B, would be out in front towards the leverage. And then it would snap off as you finish that cut. And so then you just have just a little bit of weight before you come in do your final cut. So this is what I really want to talk to you all about because this is where I think it's going to be most beneficial for your stakeholders. This is the part of pruning that I really love as a forester. Um, super cheap. You can crank out a ton of them in a day. It's very easy for um, my staff to prune between 25 and 30 of these a day, as opposed to getting up in a big elm tree where you're lucky to get one done in a day, depending on the amount of elm scale that's been in it. Um, so you can, you know, when a tree's four or five years old, <clears throat> you can just hop down the line and you're looking for very specific things in these trees. Um, you know, you're looking at the top of the tree, looking for co-dominant leads and things like that. It, it takes no time at all. And I'll show you in a video later how quickly it can go. But and I'm sorry that this is small. I didn't realize the distance that you would be away. But if you can see this tree, there are some issues here. And the goal of structural pruning is just to provide excellent structure. And if you're doing it at an early age, then you're not going to have to spend tons of time in the tree when it's mature. So you can see here, there's a large codominant lead in this branch right here. And it's actually three leaders, one, two, three. And if you move to the next branch, they're gonna remove a portion of that codominant lead just to reduce the leverage and then come back and remove the rest of it. And it just takes it in steps here. And then you can see what you have left. You have a nice straight central leader on this tree. And you know, how many cuts was that? One, two, three, five cuts on that tree. It takes very little time. So if you look at this across what you guys have contributed to the landscape and what property owners can do, especially when a tree is four or five feet tall, they can just bomb down a row, make a few cuts on every single tree, and then improve the health and longevity of that tree drastically with very little work and, and time put into it. Uh, when you are approaching a tree, these are some things that you want to look for. Uh, you want to remove the competitive terminal, terminals. I, I call those codominant leads. Um, any narrow uh, crotches. So you're looking good and crotch angle is about 60 degrees. Uh, so anything that's really narrow, you have to kind of look into the future. How big in diameter is that branch going to be compared to the main stem? And when are those going to start to rub up against each other? So you want to avoid any branch that's not going to have a good union, good wide union there and get rid of those right away. And then you're looking for dead rubbing, crossing branches. You wanna get rid of rubbing and, and crossing branches because it creates a wound, which then is a site for insect and disease to enter the tree. It's a big issue with, with fruiting trees. I'm gonna skip that one because, well, there's a good part. So why I love structure, really pruning. It's extremely efficient, like I've talked about. You only need a couple pieces of equipment. You don't have to have a truck of any kind. Uh, or a boom of any kind, you just need a hand saw, a hand pruner, maybe a pole saw. Uh, so there's not a lot of investment and it's a great teaching opportunity. Um, you can make a lot of mistakes when you're structurally pruning that aren't gonna necessarily affect the long-term health of the tree because typically those branches are all gonna be, they're all temporary, they're not permanent branches because they're down here. The only permanent branch that you're pruning probably on your structural pruning is just your leads. Right, you want to get rid of that codominant lead. That's the most probably the most important one. But anything you do below that 
main central leader is probably going to be a temporary branch. So you can experiment on trees to see, you know, how quickly they respond to it. You can make some bad cuts and it's probably not going to affect the overall health of the tree unless you're making it right at the trunk. So it's great for my staff. Uh, we use it as teaching for new arborists and even part-time technicians to go out and prune some trees structurally. And you don't have to worry about them damaging equipment or having a big rip out on an elm tree that's already under stress. <clears throat> so when I approach a tree, I like to start with, I just call it top-down method generically, because the first thing I'm looking for are those co-dominant co leads. I'm gonna repeat it a ton because it's extremely important. Co-dominant leads are the first thing that you need to address on these trees that are of the size that you're gonna be structurally pruning. So you start at the top, you look for the co-dominant leads, and then you need to identify what height are those permanent branches. Well, I have ordinances that dictate where our permanent branches are because we have to have clearance at 16 feet over the street. So I know every single one of these branches is probably temporary when I go to look at a tree after it's been planted and it's time for a pruning treatment. Uh, in the environment that you all plant trees, you know, it all depends on uh, the spacing in between trees, how, how close is it going to be to where the farmer is going to be um, farming or keeping cattle out of there. I, I don't know all the different scenarios that you all may be dealing with, but that's something to keep in mind when you're talking to the stakeholders about how they want to prune and what, what look they want on those trees. Uh, so I have also have to pay attention to what sorts of equipment are going to be driving underneath. Are there going to be pedestrians? Is it going to be safe for people walking up and down the street or kids riding bicycles? And then uh, this kind of technical branch aspect ratio. And that's just the ratio of the branch to the main stem of the tree um, or the branch to the parent branch. It'll make some sense here in a second if you're not familiar with it. <clears throat> so if you're looking at this tree, is there anything that you all notice that needs to be addressed right away? Cody, go down with a lead, right? Uh, and this unfortunately is a maple tree. Um, I despise maple trees, so if you love them, I'm sorry, but they're terrible. Um, they just die. So a co-dominant lead, it's got several. Uh, this is a, main, a really big co-dominant lead that should have been pruned off probably five years ago, and then you have some competing branches up here. Is there anything else? <laughs> Establish that, I think. Okay, The another thing that I look at is with this being a codominant lead, what is the size of this branch in relation to the parent branch or the stem of the tree? You never want to, you want to create as small of a wound as possible on any tree or any pruning cut that you have. But we look at branch aspect ratio and that also affects how we're going to prune this tree. Um, in an ideal setting, you're going to come back in a couple of years, you're going to prune it again. Um, it's not always realistic, and sometimes you have to make a really big cut on a tree for, for lots of factors that you could that are important to whoever owns the, the tree. But for me, in, in what I do, I'm looking at reducing the size of this branch or the amount of buds that are on this branch to slow down the growth on it so I can come back at a later date when that trunk is larger in diameter and my final cut will be smaller in comparison to the trunk or the parent branch. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so you see here, the rule of thumb is we want any branch that's being removed to be about one third of the size of the parent branch or the trunk of the tree. So if you look at this branch here compared to this, it's about half the size, which is a high branch aspect ratio. You know, this is about one third, which is great here, um, but we want to avoid this. So what I would do is I'd look in the upper canopy, figure out if there's any branches that could be removed that would reduce the growth rate of that branch so that I could come back at a later date when that wound would be smaller. So this is just an exaggerated example. We would probably never turn that branch off, uh, but it's a good, it's an easy picture to grab off the internet to display this. And so how do we fix them? Um, it's a reduction, for reduction cut or reduction pruning. Uh, this is a, uh, a branch that we would want to keep. 
here. So we're going to take off a significant portion of the buds on this tree to try to slow down. I think I just said that in a real confusing way. This branch would be very large compared to the trunk of the tree. So we want to slow down the growth. So we're going to remove this branch at this time, which is a pretty significant, probably has over 60% of the buds on that tree of that branch and allow this one to remain so that the growth rate slows down. And then we'll come back and remove this branch. I'm gonna skip a couple here. There was a video with this one, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Got some leaves going on. Um, got some branch. Hopefully you guys get a little bit out of this. Um, I can just talk through it. Or I can turn my computer up really loud. It's pain on here. <laughs> Okay, so this is a buckeye. Um, see, this branch is one, it's temporary, obviously, but the ratio of this branch to the main stem of the tree is a little bit bigger than what I want. Uh, so our arborist here, Eric, is going to he's going to do a reduction cut on this. If you look at these two branches, this is the larger branch. This top one here, it has more buds on it than the lower branch. So Eric is going to remove that branch. And so it's re reducing 50% of the buds, which should slow that branch down to where in a couple of years, like this year, we actually removed this branch um, so that the wound was really small. It only ended up being just like an inch and a half compared to the trunk, which was now almost four inches in diameter. That was just a couple of years ago. So it's a it's an awesome way to prune trees if you have the ability to return to the tree in a very short interval because it reduces the size of that wound the tree can compartmentalize very quickly. Uh, here's an, an example of one that's structurally pruned. It's planted in 2021 and we pruned it last year. This is an elm tree. Um, are you guys planting Princeton snow? No? What are you doing? Any elm trees? None? Um, elm trees grow incredibly fast. I love them because they can tolerate any of the soil conditions that we have in Bismarck. Uh, we remove a lot of them every year because of EAB or not EAB, Dutch elm disease and EES in <laughs> European elm scale. Uh, we have that really bad because of drought conditions that we've had in the city for several years and people don't water very much in Bismarck. Um, so we've had to remove a lot of elm trees because of that. So we really promote planting elm trees that are resistant to Dutch elm disease, and then also the Asiatic cultivars, which are more tolerant of the elm scale. So this tree was planted in 21, we pruned it in 22. Uh, anything you notice on this tree that needs to be addressed right away? Honestly, it's not a terrible tree. We wouldn't have to prune it, but there are some things that you could address. So there's a pretty tight crotch right here. If you try to look 15 years down the road, if we don't touch this branch, it's going to be it's going to have included bark, and then it's going to rip out during a loading event. Uh, and then there, there's starting to be some competition up above. Um, and then this ratio on this branch is compared to because it is temporary. We don't want this branch to get too big too early because we're going to end up cutting it off, turning it off at some point. So Christy points out that that's going to be very tight as this tree matures. So that's something that we need to correct. And then this is the tree afterwards. I'm going to show a side by side. <clears throat> so Christy uh, reduced this one pretty significantly. I would say she took 70%. And the species of the tree can dictate the dosage of the treatment. So the rule of thumb is you don't want to take more 25% of the leaf area off of the tree, typically. An elm tree take so much. You can take 50% of the leaves off of an elm tree and it'll still grow four feet the following the same year. 
that you provided treatment. Um, so this is something that we're going to be really aggressive on. Um, she did a really good job on her cuts. It takes a lot of practice to, to make this cut in the right spot. She got rid of some co-dominant leads that really weren't, you know, a big threat at this time, but knowing that we may not be able to come back in three years, uh, she was pretty proactive, which I appreciate. And this is all of what, I think it was five branches is all it took. And she had a little ladder and a handsaw. So that's the before and after. Any thoughts on that? Is that something that is foreign to you all? Or do you think that would be way too much if you were looking at this tree and then you came across it as a homeowner and you saw that in your front yard? <laughs> Homeowners don't like it. No, they don't like it. No, they don't. They don't. Not at all. You get lots of angry people. Um, Cause we don't buy all the trees that go on the boulevard in Bismarck. We just provide a service to them. Um, there are some that we provide, but most of the time the citizens are buying a significant portion of the tree. We provide a rebate for them, but they own it. But we own it also because we provide, it's, it's a conundrum. So you get lots of interesting phone calls and pissed off people. Beep that out. Um, <laughs> So she did a great job on this. And it only took, you know, 15 minutes. I hope the next video plays for you all. You can see this is uh, another um, It's playing on your end. It will play on mine. Yeah. That sucks. Um, so this is another accolade elm that was planted in 2017. I hadn't. We hadn't been back to that tree for, I think it was three years. It was getting, starting to get a little bit wild. And um, there's a codominant lead, pretty significant codominant lead on it. And then the branch ratio was about 50%. Uh, percent. So I just did a couple reduction cuts and, and took care of that codominant lead. And the video is only two minutes and 15 seconds. And I talked a lot and that's how it took that much time to completely prune that tree. Um, <laughs> So it's incredibly efficient. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of money to, to get homeowners or, or stakeholders the training. And then they have lots of opportunities in a shelter bell situation to gain experience and become proficient at this. Uh, so I think if, it, if you guys are gonna talk pruning, if you can have materials about structural pruning and the benefits of that and how it's gonna save the money or at least save the tree as far as it's gonna be in a good, it's gonna give it a jump start on the structure that it needs to be resistant to some of the loading events that we have in the state. Um, and I think you guys should really try to push that if, if those are conversations that you are having with those stakeholders. I can send the... Oh, now it's oh. working. I'm worried. I don't know. It has an audio on it though. I can send this out separately. Okay. Um, so people can watch the video. Yeah, it's, it's really hands. quick. And it, it really does just illustrate how efficient of a process it is once you know what you're looking for. I really encourage, I mean, if you look at the top, that'll tell you 90% of what you need to do to address the issues on the tree. If it's got a codominant lead, that's the most important thing that you need to address. And then look for any of uh, those ratios that are too high. If it's 50-50, if the, the branch to the side is 50, the almost the exact same size of the trunk of the tree, you wanna reduce it. And if you don't have the cut perfect on those reduction cuts, it's not going to affect the main stem of the tree by the time you come back, right? So the chances of decay entering the main stem of the tree because you had, didn't have a perfect cut, it's not a big deal in this situation. I'm not promoting you to go out and put stobs all over the trees, but don't be, homeowners shouldn't be intimidated if that's something that they're wanting to accomplish and something that they recognize needs to be done. So just in summary, uh, top-down approach, identify the permanent, uh, branch height that it needs to be, uh, and then look at your ratios of your branches. And then best times to prune is when the tree is young because you're getting the most return on investment rather than waiting till the tree is 30 years old and then you have a lot of issues to contend with. Late winter, early spring is best, and you can prune, prune in the summer for some species, but that's not something I like to tell people because most people have a hard time telling what species is what. So just as a general rule, just say it's best to do it when the trees are dormant. 
You can prune out dead branches any time of the year, um, especially you want to avoid pruning in the summer for these species here. Uh, fire blight, mountain ash, apple, cotone aster. Um, we have a wet spring, just like Leslie was talking about, the disease cycles are just like it was last year. Um, fire blight was rampant in Bismarck. And then <clears throat> birch and maple, you guys probably don't have a lot of people planting those, but when you prune them late in the spring or during the summer, they're gonna bleed. It doesn't hurt the tree. It's just aesthetically not pleasing, I suppose. Um, and that's all I have about pruning, but I'd be happy to answer any tree related question that Leslie didn't answer before, whether it's pruning or stuff that you've seen on the landscape. Yes, Tom. Just to reaffirm a couple of things, I have seen the presentation similar to this that you had done previously about pruning elm. So, of course, I went home and I have a prairie expedition elm in the backyard, and I thought, well, Doug is a good teacher. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything he just said. First two cuts, um, totally ripped the bark out. So, uh, mm -hmm. Early spring, totally followed both of the box. So, Doug's not wrong about uh, the, the bark. Um, and then I did a, a reduction cut and a couple other because uh, they had both terminal leads. My wife came home. And did I get an ass <laughs> yep. I bought the tree. I planted the tree. Um, my wife owns the tree. <laughs> Just be careful that uh, whoever is also watching, doing your work is on the same page. I think she's behind it now. I might need your help sometime. Sure. Uh, <laughs> How to, Confirming what I've done is on the right track. Yeah. How did it respond? Was that a couple it's years fantastic. ago? Yeah. Okay. Probably She's need still to, pissed though. Probably need to prune it this year. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have a Zoom question. Uh, do you ever cover any pruned cuts with anything like? No. Sealer? No. No. <laughs> Leslie, is there any situation where you would advise? No. No. Yeah. yeah I, it's a, that is a very common question. Local nurseries still sell the sealant um, in the little green jar. And yeah, it's just, if it makes you feel better, I suppose, but there are some situations that it could be detrimental to the wound. When you're doing a reduction cut, like on average, how much later do you come back and it's small enough now because the other one has grown? Like, are you talking <clears> one that's three years later? It depends on the species and the conditions between that, you know, if we're in a drought for three years and it's, an oak tree, you know, if it's an oak tree, probably not in three years, uh, unless it's a really great site. Uh, if it's an elm tree, you could probably come back in two years and make a cut on it. Uh, the tree probably will grow a, a couple inches in diameter in that amount of time if it's getting decent moisture. So it's all species and site dependent. It's just something you need to re continually reevaluate if you have the opportunity. Uh Instead of structural, what about on fruit bearing trees? Is it, is it a different concept for trying to promote fruit growth? Um, I think uh, Mr. Kalb is probably the expert on fruit tree pruning, but um, you still are looking for a lot of the same things. You're looking for the, the epicormic sprouts, the water sprouts. You want to get rid of that stuff. Any crossing branches. Initially, you, we try to establish, at least on crab apple trees, which is what we have in the boulevard. We try to establish a central leader as long as possible. It's naturally has that very quick to current growth. Um, so I'm managing it differently than what a producer would be or somebody that wants a lot of fruit. Um, there's lots of different practices, especially in the orchard setting where they are, um, I don't know what that's called. Where, I mean, they, almost, they essentially cut the tops off the tree and keep everything so that you can pick it. Um, so it depends on what your goal is with the fruit tree. I like a, Central leader and reduces the amount of trees having failure during wind events. And I don't, you know, I rarely am able to get to the apples before my kids pick them off and throw them at each other. So, um, yeah, I would still, a lot of the practices I would still probably do on fruit trees, especially when they're young. And get rid of those narrow crotches, um, which are a problem in plums and stuff like that. Anything else? All right. I appreciate the opportunity uh, very much. And you guys have a great rest of your conference. Thanks, Doug. <laughs>